Yes, uh, to appear before the committee today. Um, as, uh, as Owen was introduced, uh, he's joining me today. He's the acting assistant deputy attorney general responsible for national litigation, uh, our national litigation sector in the department. Uh, before I begin, I, I'd like to offer my deepest condolences to the families and the loved ones of the victims of the shooting in Nova Scotia in April 2020. I want to acknowledge their loss and the impact of those events uh, on the community. My remarks today will focus exclusively on the process led by the Department of Justice to produce documents to the Mass Casualty Commission. The Department of Justice and its lawyers were not involved or consulted on whether to disclose firearms information at the April 28, 2020 press conference, nor were we involved in the teleconference with the RCMP Commissioner that followed that day. So as a result, I really don't have any relevant information to provide on your questions on allegations of political interference in 2020. So I'll, I'll therefore focus my remarks on the role of the Department of Justice before the Commission uh, and on the document review and production process, including the disclosure of four pages of officers' notes related to that April 28, 2020 teleconference. And given that our time is short and that document production processes and com are complex and detailed, I have sent to the committee last Friday uh, a letter detailing, um, uh, providing more information about the document production process and our role before that, uh, that commission. Lisa Department of Justice lawyers represent the Government of Canada in the Mass Casualty Commission's investigation. One of the responsibilities of our lawyers and paralegals is to disclose relevant, in relevant documents for the purposes of the inquiry, which is standard in public inquiries and civil litigation. The disclosure of documents in any investigation is a significant task. The government has already disclosed over 75,000 documents to the Commission. The magnitude of the work is significant given the logistical challenges of collecting, reviewing, and disclosing each of these documents. It is a technical and complex process that requires a great deal of effort and time. And I would like to acknowledge the dedication of the Department of Justice employees who did this important work. In the context of this inquiry, disclosure of documents is an ongoing process. The government began disclosing documents to the Commission in February 2021. As the Commission continues its investigation, new issues are raised and that results in new document requests. That is, again, normal in this type of inquiry. As a result, our team of lawyers and paralegals regularly receive new document requests from the Commission and receive new sets of documents for review from the various government departments and agencies. The departmental team sorts through these requests based on the board's immediate needs and the priorities of upcoming hearings. A standard feature of document production in this inquiry and in civil litigation generally is the review of documents for legally privileged information. Privilege can apply to entire documents or to portions of documents according to common law or statute like, for example, the Canada Evidence Act. I want to be very clear with the committee that this document review and production process, uh, uh, the production to the Commission, is managed by the lawyers and the paralegals in the Department of Justice. The Minister of Justice and the Minister's Office are not involved in this process. As part of the document production process in early 2022, we reviewed the handwritten notes of four senior RCMP officers in order to produce them to the Commission. There were over 2,400 pages of handwritten notes. And as outlined in my letter, our team flagged 35 pages among those 2,400 uh, as containing potentially privileged in, uh, content. And knowing that uh, there were hearings coming up with these officers, uh, we decided to authorize the disclosure of the 2,400 pages, uh, but uh, with the exception of the 35 pages that we are still reviewing for privilege. Unfortunately, uh, we did not alert the Commission to the fact that uh, uh, we had um, not produced the additional 35 pages because they were being for reviewed. We've exchanged letters and, and spoke to Commission counsel and, and, uh, uh, and I think the oversight was acknowledged and understood. Four of the 35 pages only relate to the April 28th Ten meeting. seconds, sir. Can I finish? Yeah. Um, I just, 
uh, 10 seconds, uh, only four of the 35 pages related to the April 28th meeting. They, these were in the notes of Superintendent Campbell. Uh, and after our review, all of those documents have been produced without redactions. They were produced on May 30th to the Commission. Um, the rest of the 35 pages, the 31, were also produced uh, subsequently, some with redactions for irrelevant information. Uh, so we continue to work closely with the Commission sur le processus de divulgation. On the disclosure process, the government is uh, fully committed to supporting the Mass Casualty Commission's work. ...and professionalism of our Department of Justice lawyers and, and paralegals that are representing Canada before this Commission. Happy uh, to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Uh, you're aware that the Mass Casualty Commission has a public interest mandate to investigate the worst mass murder in Canadian history to get answers for the public, correct? The Department of Justice also has the obligation to assist the Commission in achieving its mandate to serve the public interest, correct? Agreed. You're aware that uh, Chief Superintendent Chris Leather recently testified that the com at the Commission inquiry that he received legal counsel from the Department of Justice, your department, to withhold evidence from the Commission, unless specifically asked, that is, your department, uh, the, the lawyers in your department, the counsel, told him to provide evidence reactively and not proactively. Is that correct? That is correct, but only with respect to the, um, I guess, what's referred to now as this wellness report. Um, so I have three reasons, really, to explain um, why I think Chief, Super, uh, Chief Superintendent Leather uh, misunderstood the advice that he received. Um, first, um, we learned of this, uh, I guess our council met with Chief Superintendent Leather on July 5th. And it was during that meeting that we learned of the existence of this wellness report for the first time. It was, from what I understand, a report that was commissioned a year after the events. Um, and um, what we counseled uh, uh, Chief Superintendent Le Leather to do was, because we hadn't seen the report yet, we didn't know to the extent to which it was relevant, if all of it was relevant, portions of it re were relevant. It was ov obviously prepared for a different purpose. And so our advice to him was, don't raise it proactively, but if it comes up, answer the questions. That was the advice we gave to him. We gave no advice with respect to uh, uh, being reactive or pro, uh, not being proactive with respect to two other pieces of information. One was about the April 28th meeting, because that information was already before the Commission, and we, we like, like all witnesses, we told them to be very Thank you, sir. So just to be clear, you're saying that there was another one, of, we've been hearing a lot of these misunderstandings, as you, I'm sure you, you are aware during this investigation. Uh, so you're saying that uh, Superintendent Leather misunderstood, but that in fact your department did advise him to be re, uh, reactive and not proactive, but it was specifically in terms of this wellness study uh, that was being undertaken for uh, Nova Scotia RCMP. But he was under the impression that that re uh, reactive approach was to be taken at large whenever he was asked questions by the commission or otherwise. So it's odd that that misunderstanding is quite significant, I would say. And he shared that uh, at the commission. So are you aware then that the Honorable Thomas Cromwell, Co Council Director of the Commission, wrote to, to a department uh, lawyer, Laurie Ward? I'm just going to pause. Can we ensure we're all muted? Thank you very much. I'm going to resume my time. Thank you. Uh, you're aware of this letter sent to the Department of Justice on August 6 from the Honorable Thomas Cromwell Commission Council Director. He was not uh, familiar that this was a misunderstanding. He is under the impression that you, your department, in fact, uh, asked Mr. Leather to be reactive in his testimony. Are you aware of his, this letter that I'm referring to? Letter says is uh, that um, he is concerned to have heard uh, of Chief Superintendent Leather's testimony and is asking us to confirm um, whether that's uh, correct or not correct. And we have responded to that letter. Uh, Lori Ward did respond to the le that letter on August 9th to explain what I just explained to you a minute ago. Have you advised anybody else to be reactive in their approach to the wellness report or the commission generally, anyone involved in this case in the RCMP or otherwise? No, th this was a comment we made uh, to, uh, to Superintendent Leather uh, because it came up when we were preparing him or our council were preparing him for a test or an interview with the commission council the very next day. So. He brought it up at a at, at the prep, and we had never seen this report. So you know, it, it's it's reasonable for us to say, well, before 
you know, uh, we'd like to see it and give you some advice before, um, you know, b b before you raise it. But if questions come up, you have to answer the questions. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Minister. So to be clear, you have not advised anyone to be only reactive and not proactive. No, and and with every every witness uh, before the uh, inquiry, we We're have counselled them time. to be Thank truthful and uh, to be uh, to assist. So, the at any time as much since the 2020 Nova Scotia mass murder, was the department concerned about political interference from government? At any time, did you advise anyone about political interference? No, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, we were not involved or nobody sought legal advice on this uh, April 28th meeting with respect to the disclosure of firearms information. Thank you. And have you provided, so you have not provided any legal advice to the Prime Minister's office, the Public Safety Minister's office, or any other ministerial office concerning the mass, uh, mass casualty? Well, we've provided lots of advice okay. to, uh, to the government, uh, but um, I think the, the allegations are with respect to um, the firearms information at this uh, April 28th press conference and the subsequent meeting with the Commissioner. So we have not no provided advice. any advice with respect to those. Uh, Justice Canada spokesperson Ian McLeod said that the final four pages of Chief Superintendent Campbell's notes were withheld until the end of May of this year because they, quote, required further assessment of what they were privileged or very aware of this. What aspect of their content merited that further assessment that took that additional uh, three months to release uh, Mr. Campbell's notes? Again, you'll remember it's those four key pages that have really initiated this entire investigation. Yeah. And, and I've said earlier, those four pages were caught up in another group of 35, uh, you know, there were 35 pages altogether that we'd flagged. We flagged things for further review. Uh, some things are uh, legal advice. Uh, that's easy to spot. Some things may be cabinet confidence. Some, some may be public interest privilege. And, and uh, depending on the nature of the privilege, we have, to, our council have to consult other people. So it takes time to review them especially since they're handwritten, and sometimes we have to go back to our clients to understand the context within which those comments were made. So the privilege our review does take some time. Ended. You know, there was this conversation that you, um, <clears throat> you, you know, this comment you just made about the fact that these four pages were uh, caught up in the 35 uh, pages. And, you know, we want to be very, very clear with folks as to why that, uh, why those pages took a little bit longer to ensure that they were uh, they were reviewed. Can you give us a very brief synopsis as to what that review process looks like and why that might have taken a little bit longer to do? Privilege review process takes time, not just with respect to these 35 pages, but all of our review processes, uh, depending on the nature of the information and the privilege that's been identified. Uh, but you can imagine if, for example, somebody mentions a Treasury Board submission or a Cabinet document in their notes, we have to review it, find out what it's about, uh, track down some in people who have information about it, usually consult the Privy Council Office to see if this is a Cabinet confidence or isn't, uh, depending on the tests uh, uh, from case law or from the Canada Evidence Act from Section 39. So that takes takes some time and we have to consult others before we can get to uh, to, uh, to to complete the review. And, and during your review, is there a, a, a consideration for quote unquote politics, whether or not there are going to be political uh, implications for the government? Uh, as I've said, so for us, it's a legal test. Um, the Obviously, we want to provide all the information that we can to the Commission, given its mandate and given the importance of getting to, uh, to, to understand what happened. Um, and so it's really a, a legal process that's done by our counsel and our peer, paralegals in the Department of Justice. And as I've said, our minister's office has not been involved in any of it. So would it be fair to say that Department of Justice lawyers don't read something and say, oh, that might be damaging to the government, we should withhold this? As whether it's relevant to the commission. And if it's relevant, it needs to be produced. Uh, subject to some uh, privileged information that may have to be redacted. Uh, did you or did you or your department ever instruct um, that any information that should have been disclosed to be withheld? Would you ever do that? No. Why not? Well, because the mandate of the commission is very clear. Our job is to assist the commission and we'll provide them with all the information within the in the possession of the government that's relevant to their mandate so they can discharge their their uh, their mandate and just for further just for further clarity what is the relationship of department of justice lawyers um, with minister with the minister's office if any 
Well, the minister is the Attorney General of Canada as well. Uh, he is uh, accountable to Parliament for the work of our department. Um, and, um, you know, all of the uh, employees in our department work on his behalf uh, uh, to discharge the obligations under the Department of Justice Act at Sections 4 and 5 of our Act. And the act, and the act uh, specifies that there cannot be political interference. Or the, the act, the act does not allow for political interference by the Minister of Justice. Correct. There's nothing in the act that says that uh, that talks about political interference. No. Um, so, but but the just so that I can that I can clarify the question, there there would not be a circuit. Would there be a circumstance in which? The Department of Justice would be concerned in this situation. Was there a situation where the Department of Justice lawyers, the bureaucrats, would be concerned that they were getting political direction from the minister's office to withhold anything? As I said, our minister's uh, office and the minister were not involved in, in any of the work being done by the department to support the government before this commission. So I had no reason to uh, to be concerned about political interference. There was there were no no discussions with the minister about this. So there were no discussions with the minister. You never instructed your uh, you never instructed the Department of Justice lawyers to withhold information. Um, why do you think this misunderstanding? Um, that Mr. Leather had would have come about. Um, you know, you talked about you talked about the circumstances around, under, around this. Why do you think there would have had that that misunderstanding? Um, uh, Chief Superintendent Leather, why? But I think you've already heard some testimony from the commissioner and others on on that issue. As I said, I, I wasn't. Uh, we were not involved at the time. Uh, we didn't provide advice, so I really don't have anything I can offer on on that. Today. Mr. Daigle, I'd like to start with a question about your letter from August 12th, talking about the mechanism of uh, producing documents to the Commission. You talked about the process of redaction and how it's done, but it doesn't talk about what happens to documents when they're being analyzed. And that's really what we're interested in when it comes to these four pages. They were withdrawn. They were not actually redacted. So I'd like to know, why does your letter not discuss, uh, you know, what happens with documents that are actually being analyzed for potential redaction? I'm not sure I've really understood the question, but the process is that we receive uh, documents from the department and, or the, the RCMP. We usually receive them electronically. We put them through our document management system, and then they are sorted into categories. So we had a category for notes from RCMP members, RCMP officers. That was around 2,400 pages. And we went through all of those documents. And during the process, we identified that there were some passages in some of those notes that may uh, require uh, privilege. So we decided to give the Commission the 2400 pages right away because they needed the documents urgently and then just to continue our further analysis of those 35 pages. Our legal counsel had the 35 pages and then uh, consulted colleagues about them before concluding that the documents, uh, before making any conclusion about, about the documents and if they didn't fall under privilege then they would be given to the Commission. And if they did, then we uh, obviously would have conducted a, a redaction. Is when uh, your officials were looking at those 13 pages from Superintendent Campbell specifically, were, were they looking at the 13 pages? Were they sequential nature? Like, were they all uh, written in, in one sequential line? Or were they 13 individual pages that were sort of handpicked out of the entirety? Um, I'm not exactly uh, sure how they were but I'm, from what I saw um, you know we, we have the entire you know books of notes um, from the RCMP officers from you know a certain date to a certain date and we've identified throughout what was relevant to the Commission and from that what we thought needed a review um, for for privilege um, 
So are they sequential? I think they, there are, they are consequential in the sense that, you know, the, the, the books start at one date and, and they go forward. So when we get to April 20th, there's some notes. When we get to April 28th, there's some notes and then, you know, and so forth. So, so, so just to be clear, like, like the, the, you're not aware if the 13 pages that were held back from Superintendent Campbell specifically, you're not aware if those 13 pages were actually uh, written sequentially a, a, in a in a specific timeline, like a journal entry. You're, you don't you're not clear of that information. Journal entry. Maybe uh, Owens had a look at this and could provide more information. My recollection is that they were in chronological order, as one would take okay. notes in a in a notebook, uh, and that okay. the the four pages uh, were were in chronological order. In a thank you, range. and and you've. You've taken some time to identify the, the kinds of privilege uh, that might exist, why they're withheld. Um, would any would notes referencing a phone call with the commissioner, like would that constitute something that people in your department might take as privilege? Were, were they concerned that the handwritten notes of a teleconference might contain sensitive information? I, I'm just I mean, four pages out of 13, that, that is actually a significant percentage to, to hold back. Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of the, the thought process of your department's lawyers that led to those four pages being held back. In pages of over, you know, hundreds of pages of documents from Superintendent Campbell, um, four of those 13 pages that we held back dealt with the April 28th meeting. Right, so we didn't just hold back the four; we held back the thirteen. Um, uh, and um, in answer to your specific question, if it's just a reference to a phone call with the commissioner, there's nothing privileged about that. Um, okay. From you know, on the face of, of of an entry in in a document, so we wouldn't have flagged that for review. We would Thank flag you. for review if there's you know a reference to a cabinet meeting or a reference to a treasury board submission or a reference to legal advice. Those with the crux of this matter, sir, of course, is related to not just accountability, but transparency and honesty. And I guess the, the big question that I would suggest that people really want to understand better is uh, there's two, two parts. Uh, one is you said we're going to provide all of the information we can, which doesn't necessarily sound transparent to me. That's my judgment. Uh, secondly, you talked about um, uh, Chief Superintendent Leather being misunderstood. And let's start with that, sir. Would you not expect that the lawyer, I would use the word cautioning, uh, Mr. Leather would make sure that he wanted to be understood, that that, that uh, reactive versus proactive nature would want to be understood very clearly? Uh, yes. Yes, I think everybody wants to be understood. Uh, and, and the advice needs to be as clear as possible. I guess then, sir, how would you come to the con conclusion that it was Chief Superintendent Leather who misunderstood the, the directions given to him? Um, so I have, as I said earlier, I have three reasons to believe that. One is um, the, the, our advice was, uh, because we didn't know what this report was, not to raise it unless the Commission raises it. So um, that was the extent of our advice in terms of being reactive or not proactively talking about this until we had a, and this was, remember, this was July 5th, and he was only appearing on July 27th. So our view was that we'll have time to get the report, look at it, determine its relevance, and figure out whether uh, it, it can and can't be. So our advice to him was, look, it's the first we hear of this, we haven't seen it, don't raise it if they don't raise it, but if they do, you'll have to answer. The other reason sure. we think that he misunderstood is because um, he, seen, he suggested during his testimony that uh, we also told him not to provide information about the April 28th meeting. And that makes no sense, sir, because all of the information about the April 28th meeting was already before the Commission. So there's no reason for us to, to suggest that. There's also the, his reference to a call, his call to uh, the Commissioner on, the, on April 22nd. We learned about that when he testified on the 27th. That was, it's not in his notes. And so for him to suggest that we told him not to talk about a meeting that we've never heard about doesn't make sense. So that's why my conclusion is that he, he misunderstood the advice. Our advice was only specifically with respect to the Quintet report because we didn't know anything about it at the time on July 5th. Sir, do you think it's possible that uh, Chief Superintendent 
Superintendent Leather understood the direction he was giving, and perhaps that uh, there was a you know interference here in in getting the truth out. You don't believe that, sir? Ask uh, uh, Superintendent Leather. I don't know what he was what he was thinking. All I know is what he told the committee uh, on the twenty fifth. Well, it's interesting, sir, that you know that he misunderstood his directions. That's the unusual thing, uh, but you don't know what he was thinking. Uh, the second part of uh, the questioning, sir, how can the families, the victims of these families, be certain that there are no other documents being withheld uh, by your department? So we gather documents from seven departments and agencies, uh, and we review them for relevance. And if they're relevant, they are produced unless parts of them or all of them have to be retained for privilege uh, based on the Canada Evidence Act or other other uh, pr legal privileges. So um, how can they be assured? Well, we've produced 75,000 documents already and we keep responding and have a very good relationship with the commission and its council to produce everything that is relevant so that the, this commission can get its job done. But sir, we also know that you didn't report back to the committee originally uh, when uh, when you withheld documents, you didn't make them aware of that fact. And of course, you continue to talk about this voluminous number. Fantastic, we understand there is a lot of documentation, but there is absolutely no assurance here for the victims' families to say that yes, all of these documents have been, been produced and are going to be made available to the MCC. Uh, how can you reassure us, sir, that that's going to happen, or can you? I w I am reassuring you that every document that we are provided with at the department will be reviewed for relevance and if they're relevant they'll be produced and this happens on a weekly basis so uh, uh, information that came out uh, at this the hearings of this committee on the 25th we learned some new things and and we've tracked it down and and produced for example uh, uh, Chief Superintendent Brennan's notes uh, were raised for the first time uh, at committee, and we've we've since uh, tracked those down and produced them. So anything relevant, um, we uh, we will be producing to the commission. And with respect to the 35 pages that we didn't uh, we 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 held back for review, yes, we should have told the commission that we held those back until we were done for review. But our intent was always to review them and, and to produce them. Uh, and that's a process that we'd followed with the commission before. And now we have sat down with the commission and set up a new process to make sure that there are no surprises going forward. And how do you coordinate with the minister's office and what boundaries are in place to prevent any sort of political interference? Uh, well, I'm, I'm the deputy minister to uh, the minister of justice. We have, uh, um, the, uh, the same relationship that any deputy minister has to uh, a minister of the crown. Um, I provide the minister with information, with briefing notes to make decisions. Um, if um, there's, there's, uh, uh, if if I think ever that there was some political interference uh, in a matter wh where there shouldn't be, I would raise it with the minister and have a discussion with him. Uh, but as I said earlier, the minister of justice and his entire office had no involvement whatsoever in the, the department's uh, um, job to review and produce documents before uh, the commission in Nova Scotia. So in this case, sir, there's absolutely, they'd have no involvement whatsoever. Can you uh, discuss uh, the steps that legal counsel takes to review documents and ensure non-partisanship in their decisions to, decision to release these documents to the public? Did you want to take that? Over? Sure. So once, uh, once documents are produced by the uh, originating department, our council and paralegals review those documents for relevance. They also review them for any legal privileges that may attach to them. Uh, they are then produced to the commission um, and uh, uh, there's ongoing productions over the course of the inquiry, uh, both in terms of the timetable and priorities set by the uh, commission uh, and in response to specific requests by the Commission uh, and uh, questions that may arise in the course of interviews or at the hearing. And I, Thank you. Thank you so much. Did you want to elaborate on that? Uh, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Will you elaborate? Sorry, sir. You had a second part to your question, which uh, I didn't quite hear. Oh, no. So, yes. So, 
is there a non-partisanship in the decision to release these documents? These are decisions that are taken uh, by the litigation team uh, working on the inquiry. Uh, these are not decisions taken at the... So the production of documents can be done automatically by uh, Justice Canada or uh, could be sub subject to subpoenas. And we've understood that there are 39 subpoenas issued. Now, the document package that included those four pages, do you know if they were supposed to be uh, produced automatically or uh, were they subject to subpoena? Unfortunately, I, I do not recollect. Uh, my impression is that they were requested by the commission. Thank you very much. Now, there was a period of around three months from the time when the notes were analyzed to the time that they were produced. Can we get some assurance that the commission would not be able to conclude its mandate as long as there were outstanding documents still being analyzed for redaction? Is that something that could potentially happen? And uh, depending on the answer, how, how can we make sure that uh, we don't have a situation where some documents are not produced? Between our team in Halifax and the lawyers in uh, of the commission, uh, there's a good dialogue. And if the commission says that, you know, we're going to conclude at the end of August, for example, well, we need to ensure that we need to have that category of documents ready and produced uh, by that date. So there's an ongoing discussion between the two teams of lawyers to ensure that the Commission has everything it needs from the government to be able to carry out its work. Perfect. So essentially it would basically be impossible for the Commission to conclude its work and to still have outstanding documents that were not produced. If we think that we have documents that are still relevant and that are still being analyzed, we would inform the Commission of that. Uh, if the Commission says, you know, we're wrapping up in three weeks, we would say there are still documents that we need to produce. Perfect. On what's changed within the Department of Justice uh, to ensure that these aren't going to be happening in the future. And, and there's an exchange of um, correspondence between um, Mr. Cromwell and Ms. Ward on exactly that, and I'm happy to share those letters with uh, with the committee so that it's clear for everybody. Um, the um, the commission suggested that um, that if we could provide a list of the Government of Canada numbers for documents containing additional pages, and and that if there's future disclosure of the additional pages contemplated in the letter, we would identify that using those numbers. So we've we've written back to uh, Mr. Cromwell to explain to him exactly how that process uh, should have uh, uh, applied and what the government numbers are. So going forward, we do have a process, and I'm happy to share those four letters uh, that explains that to uh, to the committee. If you uh, can table that with our committee, that would be appreciated. And early on in your testimony today, um, you stated that uh, you didn't see any problem with Superintendent uh, Leather releasing information about the April 28th call because that was already in the public domain. Is that correct? It's relevant to that I, at the commission. Yes. So I didn't that that. So I didn't. Un, I wouldn't understand why why. Uh, Superintendent Leather would uh, say that we advise him that he couldn't talk about that when those documents were already public. In fact, we were all talking about that. That was uh, part of what this committee heard and what the commission heard as well. And you also said that you were not aware of the April 22nd call that Superintendent Leather had with Commissioner Lucky until he spoke about it at the inquiry, correct? That's uh, that's correct. So I, I heard him uh, mention that I think at this committee on the 25th, but our counsel who are working on, in Halifax on the team uh, were in hearing that day, didn't hear it, but they heard it from him when he testified at the commission on the 27th in 2022. Okay, so the, you didn't hear about it on the call that your official or your officials did not hear about the 22nd call with Commissioner Lucky and Leather when he spoke with the Justice Department. July 5th, when we met, when our council met with yeah. him, um, he raised it for the very first time um, when he uh, testified before this committee. 
I just I find this very interesting because in a CBC interview, uh, Leather stated that he like did he reach out to the department? He reached out to you seeking legal advice, correct? With every witness to prepare them to help them prepare for their testimony. So it was it's part of the services that we we provide as the Department of Justice is to prepare the RCMP and, and other departments for their, their testimony before the commission. So Superintendent Leather stated in an interview with CBC that he specifically raised the issue of the April 22nd call with the Justice Department because he was concerned about the relevance of that in regards to the later April 28th meeting. So are you saying that Superintendent Leather basically just imagined that he brought up the April 22nd call to your officials? Met with him on the 5th. Uh, they tell me that they he had he did not raise it. It is not in the notes that he has submitted as part of the 2,400 pages of notes. Nothing in his notes mentions this call to the commissioner on the 22nd. And during his testimony, uh, our counsel were surprised to hear for the first time that uh, there had been a call on the 22nd because it had never been mentioned before he testified on the 27th. I just think it's very interesting because Superintendent Leather stated that that was the whole purpose that he wanted to talk to the Department of Justice was about that April 22nd call. So if that was the whole purpose of the meeting, like it, he didn't mention it was about a wellness report. He mentioned it was about the April 22nd call and what he could and could not share. And so the main reason that he reached out to you guys was about the April 22nd meeting, but you're saying that you don't have any evidence that he brought it up at the meeting. Our counsel are telling me he did not bring it up at the meeting and he didn't reach out for us to talk about the April 27th, 22nd call. He, uh, he met with counsel in order to be prepared on his entire testimony, uh, not, just, not just the question of the April 28th meeting or the meeting of the, 20, the call of the 22nd. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't raise that. And there's nothing in his notes for us to have raised it with him either. We didn't know that there was that call. Uh, we learned about it for the first time um, uh, when we met with him on, on when he testified about the, 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 the call on the 22nd at his testimony before this committee and then the commission two days later. Uh, the wellness report, either because it was commissioned a year after the events um, by, um, I'm not sure by whom, but, but by the RCMP, um, he raised it for the first time at, on July 5th. We had never heard of it. And so, um, so uh, you know... Have you had time to review this wellness report now that you bring it up? I have reviewed it myself, no, but our council have. And Does the Department of Justice version. consider that that is privileged at this time? Um, we have re produced a copy of the report uh, for the Commission. Uh, the Commission has not yet decided whether to make it public in part or in whole. Is it redacted in any way? It is redacted for uh, personal information, is my understanding, but I haven't seen it myself. And is your department responsible for the redactions on Leah Scanlon's testimony that we've seen the Commission? Release. You have time to respond and then we have to wrap up. I, I'm not sure which. Uh, no awareness um, of, inf uh, of, had no involvement, sorry, in the decision to retain the 35 pages of senior officer notes, including those of Superintendent Campbell. In any, I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, okay, that is correct. He, they've had no involvement uh, in the um, decision uh, to disclose uh, the 2,400 pages or to flag the 35 pages for review. In fact, they've had no involvement in any of the productions of the 75,000 documents that have been produced so far. Okay, thank you. And then, um, in terms of determination of relevance and and privilege and redactions. Those are made strictly by justice lawyers and paralegals in consultation with relevant departments and agencies, and the Minister of Justice and his office are not involved in these decisions? That's correct. My name is Darren Campbell, and I'm a serving member of the RCMP. My policing career began in September of 1990 when I was sworn into the RCMP. On that day, I swore that I would faithfully, diligently, and impartially execute and perform my duties and to obey and uh, perform all lawful orders that I receive without fear, favor, or affection of or towards any person. That was an oath I took very seriously on that day and one that I continue to take very seriously to this day. 
My 32-year career with the RCMP has taken me from the Pacific Coast to Central Canada and to the Maritime Provinces. The bulk of my career has been focused in the area of major crimes, major case investigations, and criminal operations. As part of my duties, I've been operationally deployed across our entire country and internationally. I'm committed to serving Canadians, the communities that I have served and continue to serve. I'm a proud member of the RCMP, and at the present time, I'm the interim criminal operations officer for the RCMP in the province of New Brunswick. In April of 2020, I held the rank of superintendent. I was a support services officer for the RCMP in Nova Scotia. In that role, I was responsible for a number of, of specialized policing resources, including but not limited to the Provincial Major Crimes Unit and the Critical Incident Program. As you are well aware, on April 18th and 19th, 2020, the RCMP in Nova Scotia responded to a mass casualty incident where Gabriel Wartman took the lives of 22 innocent people, and he injured many others. This incident became known as the worst mass murder in Canadian history. The perpetrator's actions devastated victim families, survivors, and has forever changed the lives of many. This unprecedented massacre spurred a major case investigation titled Operation H Strong. The objectives of H Strong were clear. To fully investigate the murders and attempted murders and to gather sufficient evidence to determine Gabriel Wartman's involvement in these horrible crimes. Further, the objectives also set out to determine if anyone had assisted Gabriel Wartman in any way before, during, or after the crimes, and if so, to gather sufficient evidence to successfully prosecute those believed to be involved. I am aware of certain allegations of political interference directed to the RCMP with respect to the investigation to the mass casualty incident. At the heart of the issue is my recollection of a meeting that I was called to attend on April 28, 2020. This meeting took place immediately after I completed a lengthy national press conference which relayed the facts that could be disclosed to the public at that time. To that point, I had provided more than two hours and 15 minutes of live national news, conf news conferences about what the police knew and what we could share with the media and with the public. The meeting had been called by the Commissioner of the RCMP and was attended by representatives from the RCMP in Ottawa as well as Nova Scotia. Prior to that meeting, I did not specifically know why the meeting had been called. However, once the call commenced, the purpose of the call became very clear. The Commissioner expressed in no uncertain terms her clear disappointment that I did not release specific information in my news conference related to the firearms used by the gunman. What was relayed to me and others during that call is at, is at issue here today. I made notes, as is my practice, specific to that meeting. I advised several of my colleagues that I had made notes uh, about what had transpired in that meeting. I disclosed all of my notes as required to the Department of Justice Canada for dissemination to the Mass Casualty Commission. I was not aware that my notes from April 28, 2020 had not been disclosed to the Mass Casualty Commission until recently. I stand by the notes that I made on April 28, 2020. I have a distinct recollection of the content of that discussion between the Commissioner, my colleagues and I. In my view, the purpose of the call was to allow the Commissioner to express her disappointment with the fact that I did not relay specific or detailed information about the firearms used by Gabriel Wharton. On several occasions during that call, the Commissioner stated that she felt disrespected, that she was sad and disappointed with the fact that I had not released the information about the firearms used and that she had been advised that I would release that information. The Commissioner also said that she had promised the Minister and the Prime Minister's office that information about the firearms would be included in the press briefing. As detailed in my notes, I attempted to explain to the Commissioner that I could not and would not release that information at that time as a premature release could have a negative impact on the investigation. It was at that time the Commissioner told my colleagues and I that we didn't understand that this was tied to pending legislation that would make officers and the public safer. I felt that meeting, I left that meeting feeling deflated and to borrow the Commissioner's words, sad and disappointed. My position was firm that I would continue to protect the integrity of the investigation by not releasing any information that could have a negative impact on ongoing investigative efforts. We owed this to the victim families, the survivors, to the public and to those tasked with completing an impartial, competent and professional investigation. There are very good reasons for that. The approach to not releasing specific information related to the firearms remained in place by the investigative team until information related to the firearms used by Gabriel Ortman was released in November 2020, 
through an access to information and privacy request directed at the Prime Minister's office, not the RCMP. Within the disclosure of that information via ATIP was specific information related to the firearms used by Gabriel Wartman in the commission of the offences. The release of the unedited information would eventually have a negative impact on individuals and could have harmed the ongoing multi-agency investigation. So in summary, it was never my intention to enter into a political uh, or public disagreement or discussion as to what took place in that meeting, nor was my response to the meeting based on any personal issues with the Commissioner or indeed any other individuals, nor was it based on politics. At the heart of the issue was a matter of principle and sound investigative best practices related to protecting the ongoing investigation, which at the time was in its early stages. The principle was the oath that I swore to uphold as a young recruit over three decades ago. I could not and would not break that oath, which is sworn by all members of the RCMP. Chair, this concludes my opening remarks, and I wish to thank you and the committee for the opportunity. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, honourable members of the committee and my colleagues. My name is Leah Scanlon. I'm a 14-year civilian member of the RCMP, and as of January 2020, my position Sorry, January 2022, my position is that of Strategic Advisor to the Commanding Officer of Nova Scotia. In 2020, I was the Director of the Strategic Communications Unit for the Nova Scotia RCMP. Before I go any further, it's important to acknowledge at the outset that we must maintain sight of what took place in Nova Scotia on April 18th and 19th of 2020. The worst mass casualty in our country's history. 22 people lost their lives including a colleague. None of us will ever understand what the victims and their families have experienced and continue to go through. Honouring the victims' lives and keeping their children and families at the forefront is what's most important. Countless others are injured physically and mentally, and they must remain in our thoughts as they face a lifetime of healing. What took place forever changed Nova Scotia, it has been indescribable and far-reaching. The strength and resilience of our Nova Scotia communities has been obvious for all to see in the aftermath of this tragedy. People have rallied together in countless ways, a demonstration of the true maritime spirit, and it makes me very proud to call myself a Nova Scotian. The tragedy of April 2020 and its aftermath um, has been a very challenging two and a half years professionally and personally. On April 19, 2020, I was involved in the operational response. Uh, the Provincial Strategic Communications Unit led the communications during the incident in the weeks and months following until the completion of the investigation in December of 2020. Our focus centered on the victims and the families, the public, and our people. I have participated in and respect the work underway by the Mass Casualty Commission, having engaged honestly and wholeheartedly in two separate interviews, and again on June 9th of this year at my appearance in the inquiry. I also respect the work of the Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, and I'm here in person prepared to answer questions in relation to my experience, specifically the following. A phone call and email correspondence hours before the press conference on April 28th, 2020. A phone call I received after the press conference and a subsequent meeting I attended called by Deputy Brennan on behalf of Commissioner Lucky on the evening of April 28, 2020. A letter I wrote to Commissioner Lucky on April 14, 2021, within days of the one-year anniversary of the tragedy, and any other relevant emails or notes I have as I've taken much time reviewing the material produced during this period. I look forward to answering your Bradley. I'm currently the Director General of Communications at the Royal Canadian Mount of Police here in Ottawa. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today on my role during the largest mass shooting incident in our country's history. It was a very difficult time. My thoughts and prayers continue to be with the families and friends of loved ones who are left behind trying to heal. In April 2020, I was the RCMP's Director of Strategic Communications for the Operations Team at National Headquarters in Ottawa. I provided strategic communication advice and support to the communications team in Nova Scotia in the days and weeks following the shooting. As part of the ongoing and routine collaboration between national headquarters and our colleagues in Nova Scotia, our support included reviewing speaking notes and messaging for media. My goal was to assist our colleagues in Nova Scotia during such a significant event. 
Our support from Ottawa also consisted of coordinating translation and assisting with the creation of visuals for the press conference. I was also responsible for ensuring communications products such as talking points and media lines were shared with communications colleagues at Public Safety Canada as well as the RCMP's analyst at the Privy Council office. This is standard operating procedure and our communication colleagues with both organizations. To be clear, Documents shared with Public Safety and PCO were final communication products such as speaking notes intended for delivery by RCMP spokespeople during the conferences. Operational information is never shared through communications channels. I also want to emphasize that material is shared for informational purposes only, not for comment or input as it related to an ongoing investigation. The lines are clear and reinforced through years of collective experiences. Chair, Member of the committee, I have worked for the RCMP for 23 years in various communications positions. Managing the communications and public affairs around the shooting was very difficult and very demanding. I would like to commend the RCMP team in Nova Scotia for their steadfast commitment to the organization and desire to share as much information with the public as was possible at the time. We are lucky to have such talent in Nova Scotia and quite frankly, in all communication shops across the country supporting the RCMP on a daily basis. Well, uh, have you received any legal advice from the Department of Justice to uh, answer our questions or the questions of the Commission uh, reactively rather than proactively, uh, as Mr. Leather has indicated that he received that information? That advice? You have not. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm looking at an email dated April 23rd sent by Commissioner Lucky to Chris Leather, Lee Bergerman, and Brian Brennan, in which the Commissioner said in her email that the Government of Canada and the Minister of Public Safety uh, were anxiously awaiting the information about the weapons involved in the mass murder. Were you aware that the Government and the Public Safety Minister were anxiously awaiting this information? At that time, uh, Chair, I wasn't aware that the Government was anxiously awaiting. I wasn't part of that email chain. However, I was aware of the fact that the Commissioner's Office was um, really looking for some detailed information specific to the firearms. Thank you. And you had mentioned in your opening remarks that uh, you believed releasing the information was, quote, premature to release and would have had a negative impact on the investigation, correct? Yes, that is correct. At this sure. point in the investigation, this was only a few days after the incident had happened in Nova Scotia. Not only, Chair, was it only a few days after the incident had happened, but there were several other agencies, including the uh, Canada Board of Services Agency, as well as the FBI and the ATF, who are conducting parallel investigations uh, to our investigation as well. So it would have had a negative impact, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the same day that uh, Commissioner Lucky mentioned in an email that was April 23rd that the government and the public safety minister were anxiously awaiting this information, uh, there was consultations with the Serious Incident Response Team, which you know is essentially an oversight body for the Nova Scotia RCMP, had advised Lee Bergerman, uh, which she said in an email to Chris Leather, Brian Brennan, and Commissioner Lucky that, quote, we have permission to release the information about weapons internally. Were you aware of this email in which Commissioner Lucky was advised uh, the information should only be released internally? I wasn't aware of that, e that specific email, Chair. However, I was aware of the CERT investigation and then the sensitivities in and around uh, what they would wish to protect related to the firearms. So I had awareness of that. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Uh, Ms. Bergerman was advising Commissioner Lucky that this was to be released internally. And then within half an hour, uh, the Commissioner released that information uh, outside of the RCMP. She sent it to the Minister of Public Safety and also the National Advi uh, Security Advisor to the Prime Minister. Were you aware of that? I'm now aware of that, uh, Chair. However, at that time, I wasn't aware that it was uh, released outside of the RCMP. Do you believe it was appropriate for the Commissioner to release this information at that time to the Minister of Public Safety? I don't believe that it was appropriate at that time. However, I do expect that there would be conversations. Um, but for, from my understanding, the direction was fairly clear that it could not be shared outside of the RCMP. Thank you. Uh, you'd mentioned in your commission testimony that you decided to make the notes on April 28th uh, because, quote, it was going to become a problem for us, referring to the April 28th meeting, the infamous meeting. What specifically seemed inappropriate about the commissioner's remarks or conduct that sort of uh, sent off these sort of alarm bells in your mind? Well, Chair, as I, I mentioned, there were investigative ob objectives which included the investigation of any other individuals who may have assisted Gabriel Wartman in any way. The release of that information would have a negative impact on the ongoing investigation outside of the investigation into Gabriel Wardman's activities. You had wrote uh, with your notes, as we as we know, that the Commissioner said she had promised the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister's Office that this information would be released. Did she say promise? I believe that she did say promise, yes. 
And you went on to write that the commissioner said that you didn't understand, you mentioned this in your opening remarks as well, that this was tied to the pending gun control legislation. So she was specifically tying uh, this to the government's legislative agenda. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So she went against expert advice. She's also been a member of the RCMP for 30 years. She was aware that this was not to be released outside of the RCMP. She did release it to the government. Uh, is that is that my understanding is correct? Is that correct? Well, as I understand it yeah. now, it was released outside of the RCMP to government, which was contrary to the directions that were provided. And specifically, it was related to the pending gun control uh, agenda of the government. Well, sir, she I, said I can't speak to that because I was never right. part of any of those conversations between government and the commissioner's office. Mm -hmm. But in the April 28th meeting, she related those two. She tied them together. That is correct. And she made that very clear? It was clear to me. She sure. made it uh, when she uh, when the commissioner attended the the committee a few weeks ago. She made it seem that that meeting was not so much about specifically this issue. It was just generally about uh, an unhappiness of communication with the Nova Scotia RCMP. How much of this meeting was about this gun control legislation and releasing the weapons information versus other things? Chair, if you refer to my notes, uh, they also explain that I left the meeting at one point in time. I would say it was probably in that meeting for around a twenty minute period of time. Uh, the information during the period of time that I was actually in that meeting was only specific to the non-release of the firearms information. It did not include any other information related to any displeasure that the Commissioner had in terms of our communications. In fact, I would even say that I have emails from the Commissioner uh, recognizing the efforts that I had specifically made on April 24th, where she references the Minister of Public Safety wanting to express his thanks for uh, the information that I had provided to the top. Would you be willing to table those for the committee and provide those emails to the committee? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. Uh, with my remaining uh, 30 seconds, Ms. Scanlon, who are you speaking with uh, in the government, public safety minister's office, prime minister's office? Can you provide the names of the individuals you were speaking with? I wasn't speaking with anyone in those offices. Uh, Ms. Bradley, were you speaking with anyone in the in public safety minister's office, the prime minister's office? What were the names of those individuals? I had no uh, connection with anyone in the minister's office or in the uh, prime minister's office. So who was the connection between uh, Nova Scotia and public safety minister's office? Was that solely Commissioner Lucky then, to your knowledge? Ms. Ms. Whelan, if you have anything to add. Uh, no, sorry, I wasn't a party to those uh, here today. Um, Superintendent Campbell, you, you mentioned in your remarks that you were not part of any conversations with the government. Can you just clarify for us that you did not have any conversations with the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's office, Minister Blair, or his staff? That's correct, Chair. I did not have any direct conversations with anyone from government on this issue. And I thank you. And I and I um, believe, um, or I, I imagine that you've you've seen the testimony from both Minister Blair and Commissioner Lucky. Minister Blair indicated that he did not um, ask the commissioner to um, um, m make any pr you make any promises in terms of releasing the the uh, the weapons that were used. And Commissioner Lucky was also very clear that she had not made any promises to the government. So would it be fair to say that, um, you know, you, you've heard their testimony when they appeared before us in July, um, that your interpretation was different than the commissioner's, Superintendent Campbell? Well, just to be clear, I haven't actually watched the entire testimony of the minister or the commissioner um, prior to this. Um, what I can say is that my recollection of the meeting that I had with the Commissioner is reflected accurately within the notes that I made and the testimony that I provided at both the Mass Casualty Commission under oath as well as appearing before this committee. Okay, okay thank you. So Mr. Minister Blair said, quote, I did not ask the Commissioner to release that information, nor did she promise me that she would. And then the commissioner said, regarding my use, again, a quote of the word promise during the meeting, I had my team following the press conference at that time. And in that context, I was trying to convey that I had confirmed to the minister that the information about the weapons would be released during the press conference, confirmation that had been made based on information that I had been provided. Um, I, one of the, the things that I was a little curious about um, we heard testimony from Lee Bergerman, and, and again, I'll quote, it should never have been shared with her, her being the commissioner, that we were going to release details of weapons and calibers or whatever. I'm curious, um, Superintendent 
Campbell, why would the commissioner not uh, have been given that information? Why should that not have been shared with her? I think what uh, Assistant Commissioner Bergerman was referring to is that um, any promise to being made to the commissioner that we would release that information. That's how I interpret that uh, that passage from her testimony. It wouldn't necessarily be about not wanting to release information about the guns to the commissioner to stay within the organization. It was about making a promise to release it publicly. That's how I interpret that. And that should not have happened. Okay, that's, that's, that, that wasn't my recollection of her testimony, but we'll we'll leave that as it as it was. Um, when was the information released to the public about the weapons, and how did that uh, become public? Referred to in my opening remarks, uh, it was in uh, November, I think November twentieth of uh, twenty twenty, that the information was released, not by the RCMP, but actually via an ATIP request to the Prime Minister's office. And I would assume that it was a briefing note uh, that was prepared for the minister's office or, or the prime minister's office, which outlined the details on the guns, as well as the names or one name of one of our officers that was actually involved in the fatal uh, officer involved shooting at Gearbrook War. Mr. Campbell, at that time, did you have the impression that the commissioner understood the scope of what she was asking, that she understood the, the scope of the risk? of what she was asking? Did she understand, do you think, that uh, communicating the type of firearm used might compromise uh, the inquiry? So thank you for your question. I do believe that the commissioner as a seasoned police officer would understand that certain information should be protected, uh, particularly if there are multiple agency ongoing investigations. So I, I can't speak for the commissioner. However, I think that it's reasonable for me to to answer that question in that in that way. Yeah. And at the time of this discussion on April 28th, you yourself raised the question of or the issue that this might cause uh, the inquiry to be compromised. Is that correct? I did in, in terms of not just the investigation that was being handled by the RCMP at that time, but also, as I stated earlier, multiple investigations by multiple agencies, including international agencies as well. That was made clear to the commissioner. That was made clear to my colleagues. Uh, I had been asked, in fact, uh, leading up to that press conference by my colleagues within Strategic Com Communications in Nova Scotia, if I could say more about the firearms. And I explained to my colleagues in Nova Scotia the reason why I could not. And that was clearly communicated to everyone. And it was it was actually quite simple. Could you describe the way Commissioner Lucky reacted when you talked to her about how important it was not to communicate that information? Well, Chair, as I explained in my opening remarks, uh, the Commissioner was um, upset. Um, the Commissioner uh, made me feel as if I was stupid and I didn't seem to understand the importance of why this information was important to go out, the information specific to the firearms as it was related to, to the um, legislation. She didn't seem to appreciate or, or recognize um, the importance of maintaining the integrity of an investigation. Could you tell me around how long that part of the discussion lasted? Like the part of the discussion that was specifically about the risk of, of compromising the inquiry? Well, of course, I'm going back more than two years uh, since that conversation took place. But I would say that um, my comments to the commissioner and others that were in, in that meeting probably lasted at least two minutes of me trying to explain um, and it was on the heels of that explanation is where I was provided information or I was told that it, this was you know this was very important because it was this was about legislation that was going to make officers and the public safer that was the response I received to my uh, my rationale provided for not releasing the information it's, it's at any point, did Commissioner Lucky try to refute your arguments 
you know, when you were arguing that this would pose a risk uh, to to the inquiry, did, did she try to convince you that there was no risk? Or was, did she simply want the information to be revealed for other reasons? My recollection is that the commissioner did not dismiss what I had said uh, in those terms, uh, meaning that she didn't believe that it would um, have a negative impact or try to provide a different uh, perspective. Uh, she immediately uh, linked it to ongoing uh, efforts to uh, bring forward some new legislation. Donc, je comprends. So, to summarize, the conversation about the risk of talking about the specific firearms use, uh, that was actually a fairly short conversation, and the commissioner did not try to refute your argument, but it seemed to her that the this issue of risk didn't seem relevant to her. Did I summarize that correctly, uh, in your opinion? For my opinion, I would say that the commissioner felt that the release of the information was more important uh, in her view because the focus of that discussion was in and around the fact that I did not release that information. Whereby they are logged. Like, are they, do they go into an official logbook? How, how are those records kept? Um, are, are there some examples where there are personal handwritten notes only for the officer in question's recollection? Or are they, they logged with the detachment? I just want to know a little bit more about that process. Okay, thanks for your question, uh, Chair. Notes are used by all police officers. They are not the property of the officer. They are the property of the RCMP. And those notes are disclosable for any type of inquiry or investigation, uh, any kind of legal proceedings. Um, those notes uh, can be produced at any time. Um, they are kept specific uh, to those officers. They are not logged into a general notebook. Uh, each officer would keep a notebook uh, of their own. Uh, and specifically, my practice would be normally for a larger investigation to keep a separate notebook on that investigation itself. And, and to be clear, um, when you wrote the notes of the, uh, the April 28th conference call, you, this was a simply a, a normal course of your duties, something you've done since you were an RCMP recruit, and, and you really had no idea that the notes from that time uh, would result in, in what all of Canada knows today. Particularly in relation to where I find myself today. However, um, I was concerned uh, about what transpired uh, during that meeting in April 28th of 2020. Uh, I did make notes uh, that reflect my recollection specifically of that meeting. And I also, as I testified earlier, uh, I also was fully aware that those notes would become disclosable. And that could become an issue at some point in time uh, during a multitude of proceedings like this or the Mass Casualty Commission or other criminal trials that were related to this investigation. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, in the previous meeting that our committee held at the end of July, um, we did hear from a number of witnesses and the minister, the previous minister of public safety, the Honourable Bill Blair, you know, he was very clear to point out that, you know, there's a hard line that he's never crossed in terms of giving operational directives uh, to the RCMP. But I think there might be some confusion over whether this was an operational directive or a communication directive. In your view, you know, was this, could you help clarify what your interpretation was during that conference call, uh, or was it a little bit of both? Question, I do believe that um, it was a bit of both. Um, any release of information that could have a negative or detrimental impact on investigation falls into the operational side. Uh, but I also believe that there was a potential benefit uh, to releasing this information. Uh, so that's on the communication side. So to answer your question, I would say it is both. Thank you. And when Commissioner Lucky stated on the call that um, this was tied to pending gun control legislation, I mean, when we now have the benefit of hindsight of knowing that the order in council came in May of 2020. Um, was any a clarification given on that particular point on, on gun control legislation? Like, did anyone ask 
for further details or was it just simply announced that it was tied to impending gun control legislation? Chair, it was an announcement that was made and quite frankly, I didn't want to hear anything more about it and I didn't ask. And that was the reaction around the room? Like was, was there a, 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 re a similar reaction around the room with other participants in the conference call? Well, I can speak to my observations of the reactions of others in the room, and one of my colleagues is here with me today, Leah Scanlon. Perhaps she can uh, answer uh, your question as well. But uh, I would say that uh, my perception was is that the reactions were, were fairly consistent for those that were in the room with me. Uh, my first question is to uh, Superintendent Campbell. My uh, understanding, Minister Blair testified before this committee that on April 23rd there was a cabinet meeting. We also know from emails that uh, later that day, Commissioner Lucky emailed the Nova Scotia team seeking uh, the list of firearms found in the vehicle and said that the government was anxious for this. Uh, we also know that later on that evening, she provided that to a number of civilians, the chief of staff, the minister, and five other government officials, none of whom uh, work for the RCMP. My understanding is also that the CERT clearance was to only share that information within the RCMP. Do you have any idea what kind of political pressure the minister was under in order to go around the CERT requirement uh, and provide that information contrary to their directive outside the RCMP? I was asked what type of pressure the minister was under. Could you just clarify? No, that? sorry, the commissioner. Well, as I, as I had already testified, I... I wasn't present or party to those conversations. I don't know uh, how much pressure, if any, was being placed on the commissioner because I wasn't part of that. But I do believe that there was, um, because of the emotions and the need for answers, there were many people who were asking a number of questions. Uh, and, and I would imagine that would have placed a considerable amount of pressure on the commissioner of the RCMP at that time. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon, uh, in your... Um testimony, uh, your interviews with the Mass Casualty Commission, you mentioned that you had regular contact with Dan Bryan, who was Media Relations and Issues Management for the RCMP. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And uh, in that statement, you said that Mr. Bryan, he's in one of the statements, he has tons of experience with government and people he knows. He was a connection into the government. Is that correct? Yes. Did uh, he ever mention to you in the discussions you had with him either before the mass casualty incident or afterwards that he was talking regularly with people in government? No, he did not. He did not. So you're not aware that he may have had any discussions directly with the minister's office where he had worked previously to this job in the RCMP? Correct. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Um, Ms. Scanlon, um, in your notes uh, or your letter, you're quite descriptive of your experience with the, uh, with the uh, situation on April 28th. Uh, also, you had mentioned earlier that two hours beforehand, I believe, you had been informed that they wanted the details released. Who asked you that question? Deputy Brennan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is the recollection, obviously, of Superintendent Campbell's notes of that meeting accurate from your perspective? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, uh, did the uh, minister say that she promised the minister that she would provide that information? I believe you meant the commissioner say? The um, commissioner, yes. sorry. Um, yes. I don't recall verbatim the exact words that were used, but I would never dispute Darren Campbell's notes. Um, and I just think at the end of the day, whether we're saying promise, pressure, uh, influence, they all lead to the same uh, end result. Thank you. I, I do have a lot more questions, Madam Chair, but I do have a motion I'd like to move at this time, if I could. Uh, MP Perkins, it's uh, your time, so go ahead. I would like to put forward that pursuant to standing order 1082, the committee hold a three-hour meeting on the allegations of political interference in the 2020 Nova Scotia mass murder investigation study, including 30 minutes of committee business, no later than September 16th, 2022, to hear from the following witnesses. Zita Astravaz, 
Chief of Staff to the Minister of Emergency Preparedness, Felix Cachion, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, Director of Nova Scotia's Serious Incident Response Team, Ken McKillop, Assistant Secretary to the Cabinet, Communications and Consultations, Privy Council Office, Dan Bryan, Director of Media Relations for the RCMP, Cindy Bayers, Director of Strategic Communications, RCMP, and that the calendars and phone logs from April 18th, 2020 to April 22nd, 2020, of the Minister of Emergency Preparedness and his Deputy Minister and his Chief of Staff be provided prior to the meeting. And I believe that has been provided to the committee uh, for the clerk to circulate. Uh, thank you, MP Perkins. May I suggest that we pick this up after we have MP Nor Mohammed and also um, my voice um, related to the ATIP uh, process to Ms. Willen. Can you very quickly explain to us um, who handles the ATIP process and whether or not political offices can dictate what is and is not released? Well, in this case, it was a, an ATIP from the Privy Council office, uh, just, but just in general, no, the, uh, the ATIP uh, shop would um, would contact the Office of the pri uh, pri Primary Interest. Uh, they would uh, identify potential redactions. Uh, the ATIP shop would then uh, confirm and the information is released to the uh, requester. Thank you. Um, all right, well, if you just switch gears a little bit now uh, and start with you, uh, Chief uh, Superintendent uh, Campbell. Uh, when you uh, when you were uh, describing uh, your recollection of the events, um, you noted that you had never uh, heard uh, from the minister or from any other political office, whether it was the prime minister or the prime minister's office, um, a direction uh, to the commissioner um, to demand the release or instigate the release of any information, correct? Not. And uh, Ms. Scanlon, was it... Was it the same in your case? Correct. Okay. Um, the commissioner, so we had the minister say that uh, he didn't ask for the release of in this information. And the commissioner said that she did not feel pressured uh, by the minister or other political offices to do anything. Um, what do you think prompted or why do you think then there was this sense of uh, pressure? Well, as I testified earlier, Chair, there was pressure for information from all sides, whether it be the public, the media, um, government, within the organization itself. Um, but it was clear uh, during that meeting that uh, the commissioner uh, had said that she had made a promise and that it was tied to the legislation. I can't speak to who it was that might have had those conversations. I can only speak to the fact that I was involved in a meeting on April 28th and that's what I heard, and that's what I made notes of. But you never heard the minister or the prime minister's office or any minister's office direct um, her to do anything. Is that correct? No, I didn't. And in fact, it would be very inappropriate for me to have those conversations at that level. I, that would not happen at my level whatsoever. So I guess this is this is what I'm struggling with a little bit because I, I want to make sure that um, you know we are all very clear. One of the things that that I think we all hate is the idea that the work that the RCMP does be politicized because what you do is incredibly important and all Canadians should be able to see the work that you do as independent and uh, as in the public interest. So um, at no point did anyone from the RCMP um, that we've spoken to say uh, or have, has heard the minister or the prime minister's office or the minister's office demand um, a particular action in this regard. So I guess what we're struggling is how do we make sure that the public understands that the RCMP's work was not compromised? How is your work not compromised? Is that question again, Chair? Is that directed yes, towards me? Yes, you. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to answer that question in terms of how do we make the public understand that our work was not compromised. Uh, our work could very well have become compromised. Um, that's a very difficult question for me to answer. You're, but you are here before us uh, saying that the minister's office never, never directed or you never heard the minister's office direct anyone to do anything. You never heard the prime minister's office direct anyone to do anything. You never heard the prime minister direct anyone to do anything. Is that correct? That's correct. I never heard uh, the minister or the prime minister's office direct anyone to do anything. However, 
there has been evidence before this committee of emails that would suggest a certain or a significant interest in that information from the minister's office between the commissioner of the RCMP's office. So whether those conversations took place verbally, I can't speak to that. But I can. I, what I can say is that I think the evidence is clear that there was interest uh, by the minister's office with uh, with respect to specific information of those firearms. Now, do you have the same understanding as Mr. Campbell that Commissioner Lucky understood the risks that uh, disclosing this information could have uh, in terms of compromising the inquiry? Yeah, my takeaway, my experience from that conversation was um, the risks seem irrelevant. So, Commissioner Lucky understood well the risks, in, in your opinion, but it that seemed secondary to her because she was more concerned about disclosing the types of firearms. Is that correct? Well, I can't speak on behalf of the commissioner, um, so it's it'd be unfair for me to say that um, she could speak to what she understood. Um, and as a police officer, I think she would have a clear understanding of what it means to compromise the integrity of an ongoing investigation, especially one of uh, the largest mass casualty in Canadian history. I'd like to refer to an email that you sent. Uh, it was your team that was in charge of uh, uh, disseminating information. And I'd like to hear you talk about the scope of uh, Commissioner Lucky's decisions, uh, you know, in terms of what should or should not be uh, disclosed during the inquiry. Again, um, oh, my communication um, is not with the commissioner directly. I communicate with National Communication Services, so Sharon Tessier, Dan Bryan, and Jolene Bradley, my colleague. Um, so I can't determine exactly what the commissioner's scope was or what. Uh, um, I can only speak to what my experience was, and so. Um, on early days on April 19th, um, we had released, we had done a press conference where we indicated a, a number of victims. Um, and later that evening, the commissioner released a separate number. And again that evening, she released another number um, in one off interviews, which, um, unbeknownst uh, to us in Nova Scotia, I actually found out from the media. Um, and we had committed to, we, Nova Scotia RCMP, had committed to doing a press conference the following day where first order of business, so we'd be updating uh, um, a number of things, including the number of victims. Um, but yes, so um, again, that's, that's publicly available. And in terms of um, issues thereafter, um, the commissioners, uh, I'm making assumptions. I mean, Sharon Tessier or Jolene could speak uh, more appropriately to this, but at the end of the day, that's who I deal with, um, and I would make the assumption that they're taking uh, more direction directly from the commissioners. That would be the most appropriate. Do we as legislators need to make an effort to uh, reform a section of the RCMP Act so that those guardrails, those legislative guardrails are firmly in place? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, no, my, as I stated in the letter that I wrote, um, um, and I do have notes also from that day. I have notes from April 28th that were disclosed to the Mass Casualty Commission and uh, federal DOJ um, that I, I haven't seen yet publicly, but I do have notes. Um, yeah, it was a, I, as I stated, it was a feeling of disgust. Um, I was embarrassed to be a part of it. I was embarrassed to be listening to it. Um, and I, message received. I understood exactly what was being said. Um, and then with regards to the latter part of your question. I don't know the uh, the act specifically, but I just think it's important that it, yes, I, I think it's important that it be examined. And um, we should, there, there needs to be a level of independence so that from the selection process all the way through that there's not, um, there's a very different, a mandate letter and keeping our partners informed or providing information to the Minister of Public Safety or the Minister's office, that's very different than interfering, influencing, um, or exerting pressure. So I think that words need to be carefully examined and if it's vague, we should be more specific um, so that we're never in this situation again, especially those on the ground who are dealing with 
the investigation. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's exceedingly clear that there continues to be an evolving story here. I think on behalf of uh, certainly the families uh, who uh, are mostly my constituents, I would suggest that uh, as the story evolves, there are others out there who uh, who do know the answers to these questions. And even though uh, perhaps at the current time it, it uh, is becoming the integrity of those RCMP officers who are on the ground who made notes uh, and provided those very graciously uh, uh, to the public at large, it's very, very clear uh, that there's more to this story that is not coming forward. And I also would believe that to uh, Mr. McGregor's point, uh, there are other things that need to be uh, well elucidated in terms of the independence of the RCMP. And I think Mr. McGregor tried multiple times to get towards that today. Uh, and obviously we need uh, more information to understand better exactly A, what happened. And, uh, and I think perhaps uh, equally as important how we're going to move forward with respect to uh, ensuring that this type of political interference uh, is not uh, allowed to continue. I thought also that uh, Ms. Scanlon made an interesting uh, remark with respect to the choice of, of the commissioner, how that commissioner is chosen at the current time. Of course, we know it's a political appointment and they serve at the uh, pleasure of the, uh, of the minister. So obviously there's more to be understood. There's more stories to be told. And I certainly think that continuing on with the appropriate witnesses is uh, absolutely imperative, uh, not just uh, uh, for those uh, families and constituents who are affected in my writing, but for all of Canada so that we can continue to understand that we can have faith in, in the uh, systems uh, of policing that we have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Ellis. Uh, Deputy Normandie, Ms. Normandie. Yes, thanks. So just a point of clarification for uh, those who are moving the motion. I'd like to better understand what type of information are we trying to get from these witnesses? You know, is there information that would not have previously been disclosed in the committee's previous two meetings? You know, I understand that we're looking to understand the minister's responsibility here rather than the officials who might not always be aware of what's going. So I'm just curious, like, what type of information are we trying to get here and what type of witnesses might be able to provide us with that information? Uh, merci, uh, Deputy. Thank you. Um, MP Perkins, please. Well, Perhaps uh, MP can, Perkins can respond. Mr. Yeah, hopefully I can. Uh, I, I had my hand up to speak anyway, so I think it's timely. Um, I think I think uh, primarily when you look at the witnesses, several of these witnesses we've already asked for before, so we're asking for again. There seems to be some confusion on the issue of the provision of the and uh, the firearm list to the political level that from emails appears to have happened through the minister's chief of staff. So there is a question as to where did that direction come from? Even some of the liberal members have raised the issue and questions today asking about whether or not uh, uh, where the request for this information was coming from. We know from the email stream that it was provided to uh, the minister's chief of staff. And from the text of that, we also know that, the, uh, that it appears to be a response to a request. Uh, secondly, uh, we have had uh, some various testimonies, both here and in the Mass Casualty Commission, about the role of CERT and when CERT said and what the rules are for CERT in providing that information to civilians uh, at the Mass Casualty Commission. And again, here today, those who were provided this on the 23rd were not members of the RCMP, and that seems to be contrary to the CERT's um, uh, request. So it's important to have a clear understanding of that process in this and whether or not rules were breached. Um, as well, uh, Mr. O'Brien has been mentioned in the Mass Casualty Commission uh, uh, testimony of various people as intervening on things like uh, the messaging around how many victims there were. So he was involved in the communications decision-making process. And obviously he has some background in his life before that, that leads to, leads to his connections with the government at the political level. Um, Ms. Bayers was also mentioned in the Mass Casualty Commission as 
asking whether or not on the 28th they're going to release the information. So she was clearly contacted by someone suggesting that that should be done. We need to get to the bottom of those issues. So there's still a lot of mystery in, uh, in my mind as to uh, where the request came from to send this information outside the RCMP. And I know it wasn't released publicly, as some people said, but in essence, when you're releasing it to civilian people, such as the chief of staff, the minister, the government officials that were listed on Commissioner Lucky's uh, email of the 23rd of April, it's clear that there was a release beyond, uh, beyond uh, the limits of what CERT said, and we need to delve into and understand why those requests were made, who made them, when they made them, and why they were requesting to go around uh, the normal police procedure in this, in this terrible incident. So I think there's a lot of clarity we still need to get from these witnesses, and that's why I put them forward. Thank you. Thank you, MP Perkins. MP Damoff. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And um, I would uh, respectfully disagree with my Conservative colleagues that there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered. I think the, the information that we've received in the two meetings that we've held already with the Minister, the Commissioner, who were both clear, very, very clear in their testimony that um, there was no political interference. The testimony that we've heard today from the Department of Justice that there was no political interference in what was released to the Mass Casualty Commission. And even in the testimony that we've heard in, in the last panel here today, um, I want to be um, also stressed that this new motion that we uh, have received um, that only two of the, the witnesses were on the list previously. Uh, they were invited, as my understanding, by the clerk and were unable to attend today. Um, so I would like to propose an amendment to um, the motion that we've been put forward, Chair. Um, that So the, the amendment would, uh, that pursuant to Standing Order 1082, the committee, and then everything after the words committee be removed and replaced with um, convene a meeting for committee business to determine if it wishes to continue the current study and if so, what witnesses should be heard from and that that meeting be held after September 19th, 2022. Uh, thank you, MP Damoff. Are you able to send that amendment to the clerk, please? Uh, I can. I do not have it in both official languages, but I will uh, send it to, it's not very long, so I'll send it to her in English. Um, and may I just ask, uh, while we while you get that uh, done, can I just ask uh, as a point of clarification for those, since you've, you've read it once and just want to make sure I'm clear on what the amendment is uh, looking to achieve, so that we would uh, convene a subcommittee meeting, which would be an in-camera meeting, uh, to determine if we wish to continue, and if we do, what witnesses would be invited, and that we should have the subcommittee in-camera meeting following September 19th. Is that correct overall? I actually did not specify that it was subcommittee, oh, Chair. Okay. Pardon me. Um, but I did say after September 19th, so it would be up to the chair to call a meeting of committee business. Now, normally we do do it in camera. Um, so, I, I mean, I would be open if someone wanted to add that to my amendment. But at this point, it just says to convene a meeting of committee business after September 19th to determine if we want to continue. Okay, so the motion does not specify in camera. So otherwise, it's in public then. That's correct. correct. Okay. Um, okay. So this is officially moved then, Clerk, and then we are debating the amendment now. Uh, MP Lloyd. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, my concern with the amendment, and perhaps uh, Mr. Moff can clarify for this, is that if the chair, like one, the chair can call a meeting after September 19th to discuss committee business, there's no debt, there's no timeline that forces him to call a meeting uh, right after September 19th, they could delay it. Uh, and also, I don't think there's anything in your motion that states that the committee business has to prioritize a discussion about what we want to move forward on with this. So we could have a meeting about committee business and somebody else can put up their hand and uh, totally uh, uh, change the complete subject of, of what we're discussing here. And so um, I would like some assurances that 
you know, and, and not necessarily, I'd like some assurances that if we did have this committee business meeting, that the committee business uh, would be primarily uh, and, and prioritize that it would be about uh, this study um, and that it would happen in a timely manner uh, as soon as possible, even before September 19th, possibly, but or right after September 19th, not uh, later in October or in November. Um, and secondly, on the, uh, on the original uh, motion, which is now being amended, I think it's very important that, uh, you know, we have email evidence that shows that the chief of staff, Zita Astrovis, was in communication uh, with the commissioner on the subject of the, uh, the, the uh, public uh, disclosure uh, related to the, the, uh, the mass casualty event. And, and I think we've, we've, we've explored a lot of different sides of this issue. We've explored the Department of Justice, obviously, the RCMP, um, the minister himself. Um, but what we haven't explored is the connection in the minister's office, which we know exists. And I think it behooves us to uh, look at every corner of this. Uh, it's not a fishing expedition. We do have the evidence that there was discussion between the chief of staff and the commissioner. Um, so this is an, an important link. And I'd like to see, uh, you know, something productive come out of this study where we can say, here's where there was a mistake, whether or not it was political interference, or if it was a misunderstanding, or if it was a breakdown in the protocol, um, or if somebody's responsible for a, a, a severe lack of judgment, which I do think is the case here, um, I think we need to come, we need to have those witnesses so that we can have a comprehensive report. So that's my concerns with the amendment and I'll, I'll rest it there. Thank you. Thank you, MP Lloyd, MP Perkins. Uh, I, I think MP Ellis was up before me, but I'll leave that. My apologies, MP Ellis Sorry. and then MP Perkins and then MP Nor Muhammad. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, the recognition. Uh, that being said, I can't underscore enough uh, the seriousness of these allegations and the seriousness that it creates uh, in my riding of Cumberland Colchester. People do not have any faith at the current time in the Mass Casualty Commission and to continue to use the testimony that we have already heard uh, with written notes uh, from uh, a very, very reputable member of the RCMP and to uh, question his integrity is an absolute travesty. Uh, we also had corroboration today from uh, Ms. Scanlon with respect to what she heard in that meeting as well, also with uh, notes, uh, which uh, obviously we will have access to as well. Uh, that being said, I think it behooves us all as parliamentarians in Canada's worst mass uh, shooting uh, in history that we take this very seriously, that we obviously do understand uh, in the vernacular, somebody's not telling the truth. And that is very, very disappointing to me. And I think it's very disappointing to Canadians at large. And for that reason, uh, I would uh, certainly not be supportive of, uh, of this amendment. Thank you. MP Perkins, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the amendment to my motion um, seems to just delay what we're doing here today. I mean, the reality is that we we know we are missing these key links in the chain of potential political interference in the largest mass shooting in our country's history, uh, and the delay of this till after September 19th, for those who are watching September 19th, that's when the House resumes, to have this discussion, which we can have today. And we, we've given adequate time for those witnesses who have already been mentioned twice in motions before this committee to find the time to come here in September. If we wait until September to discuss this, given committee business on other studies, it's going to be... Uh, further delayed and there is a bit of urgency the mass casualty commission does have a deadline uh, this fall and it has reporting deadlines we need to continue our study as soon as we can to get these folks there particularly in the confusing testimony that's there with uh, what we've seen from the chief of staff's clear requests on april 22nd and april 23rd all around the cabinet meeting that was held that day on this issue uh, asking for details that the civilian level was not entitled to. And the only people that can answer for that are the people on this list. And 
they have not been allowed or enabled to appear now, and we need to hear them, or this committee's uh, study of this will actually be uh, questionable in any conclusions it comes to. Thank you, MP Perkins. MP Norm Mohammed. I have to confess, uh, listening uh, to all of this, uh, just a reflection. First of all, um, we've now heard the commission of the RCMP say she wasn't pressured. We've heard the minister say that he never pressured anybody. We've heard political offices say that, you know, we've heard that no political office pressured. And we've heard two reputable members of the RCMP, in particular, uh, Chief Superintendent Campbell, say that he never heard the minister uh, or political offices, the prime minister's office, pressure. Um, uh, or direct the commissioner to do anything. So with that backdrop and, you know, with the fact that we are now, see, it's seemingly, we have this desire to replace the work of the Mass Casualty Commission, which we should not be doing. I would uh, recommend, uh, and I would like to uh, move that we just adjourn debate now. Uh, thank you, Nur Mohammed. I, I will say it's disappointing that you do not allow the NDP to speak. Do we have an opportunity to say, can you rescind it? To allow MDP? No, we don't. Okay. Well, we'll go to a vote um, and uh, we'll call the vote. And I go to the Liberals first. Uh, you go ahead. Sorry. On the motion that debate be adjourned, um, Mr. Xiang. I vote yes. Ms. DeMoff. Yes. Mr. McKinnon. Yes. Mr. Nur Mohammed. Yes. Mr. Shefke. Yes. Mr. Lloyd. No. Mr. Perkins. No. Mr. Ellis. No. Madame Normande. No. Mr. McGregor. I'll abstain. So five yeas and four nays. The vote, uh, the vote to adjourn passes, and the meeting is adjourned. Uh, no, nope. I'm out of your oh, point. I'm sorry. Point I'm sorry. No, no. I got it, bad advice. Sorry. My apologies. It just only debate was adjourned. Oh, the debate. I'm so sorry. The debate is adjourned. <laughs> point of order, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay, please. My apologies, colleagues. This is my first experience with this situation. MP Lloyd, go ahead. Um, is it my understanding that uh, maybe the clerk can answer that the uh, German on the debate is on the uh, sub amendment or the amendment uh, by Ms. DeMoff or does this dispose of the debate on the amendment and the sub amendment together? Uh, the, cl the clerk's opinion uh, or professional advice is that it adjourns the debate on the motion the in, in, in its entirety with the amendment. Understood. Madam oh. Chair, I'd like to move a motion. MP Lloyd, go ahead. Yes, um, the motion is uh, that pursuant, and I think maybe there's a bit of a compromise here, um, you know, pursuant to the, the meeting that the committee uh, agree uh, to hold a meeting to discuss uh, future steps uh, with this study and that this meeting be held uh, between September 19th and September 30th of 2022. Point of order. Thank you, MP Lloyd. MP McKinnon on a point of order. Yeah, I believe that uh, that is a repetitive business. We've already dealt with this issue substantially with the with the motion, which has now been adjourned. So I think that the uh, Mr. Lloyd's motion needs to be out of order. And we're just going to suspend for one moment while I consult with the clerk. Proposed new dates is September 19th to September 30th that the committee meet in. Can you just please repeat that? The clerk is just wanting to see how if it is substantively different than the other motion. I'm proposing that the, uh, the committee meet to discuss committee business between the dates of September 19th and September 30th uh, to deal with the question of 
uh, how to move forward with this study. Um, I think that that is substantial and it's different than the original motion, Mr. McKinnon, so your point of order does not stand. Uh, Mr. McGregor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I was just going to actually object to the point of order. I did think it was substantively different and um, I think I congratulate Mr. Lloyd. I think a good compromise has been reached and it actually echoes a sub amendment. I was going to move to the amendment. So I think this is something uh, that hopefully we can all agree to and I'll keep it at that with uh, hopefully us getting to a vote. Thank you, MP McGregor, MP Damoff. Thanks, and, and just before I speak, Chair, I'd just like to commend you on what you've been able to do today. I know you were put in the position of taking on the chair at the last minute, so I'd just like to thank you for um, very valiantly leading us in this meeting. Um, and to my colleague, Mr. Lloyd, that's essentially what I was um, trying to get to with my um, change to the original motion and we would be supportive of uh, a meeting being held between September 19th and September 30th. So we'd support your current amendment on the floor. It's a motion, but I, I believe your point stands. Yes. Sorry, motion on the floor. Yes, sorry Thank about you. that. If I see a few hands up, but I think that they're just holdovers from when the individual spoke. Are there any other comments? It uh, seems to be agreement. Uh, we don't need to vote if there's general agreement. Uh, are there nods that we can have this motion pass? I'm seeing thumbs up from all parties. Okay, then the motion is uh, is passed.